discussion. This panel is about equity, diversity, and inclusion. And it is a panel discussion. So we'll be uh, starting with an intro to the session um, and an intro to our panelists, but then we'll be moving right into it to questions and discussion. Um, the way that it's structured, I'm gonna start with some intro slides. Um, I'm gonna then let the panel introduce themselves. Uh, and then we're gonna move into some questions that we prepared ahead of time or that I prepared for the panel. Um, we're gonna talk about those, but please uh, feel free to weigh in on the Q&A and chat. And I'm gonna do my, my best to keep an eye on that um, while, while we're talking. And if things are coming in that I, I feel can be brought into the conversation, I will do so. Um, I'll also try and um, reserve some time at the end if some really great questions, comments, ideas are coming in. And if, if it works, we can try uh, unmuting people and bringing them in if, if they want to. If you do put a question and you wanna tell me if you feel like speaking or not, feel free to do that as well and, and we'll do our best. Um, so my name is Erin Heffron. Again, I'm the, the moderator for this panel. Um, my background, I'm an independent contractor. I mostly work on the EV Nautilus um, as a mapping coordinator and navigator, but also have been doing some work recently with Lamont related to GMRT um, and have been involved with programs with Fugro and University of Alaska and, and quite a other, bunch of other things and um, came from a commercial background where I was at QPS for about 10 years and USGS before that. So that, that's kind of my background. Um, after I go through the slides introducing this session, the panelists will go through and tell you about themselves. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Sorry, coming any minute, share screen. All right, um, I'm hoping everyone can see that. I can't see your faces. So if, if there's an issue, you're gonna have to shout to me. I'm down to one screen and it's destroying me already, but I'll do my best. Um, so again, this panel discussion is all about diversity, equity, and inclusion in ocean mapping. And you can see here uh, my name and also the name of, names of our panelists. So I wanted to start with what is this panel about and just um, kind of very basically what are definitions for diversity, equity, inclusion? What do they mean? We all have preconceived notions of what they mean. But this, um, I think this was a pretty good description. I took this directly from that website, um, left the quotes out, but they're direct quotes, unvetted. So it looked like a pretty legit website, but I think they had some pretty good language. So I just went with it. Um, I think we probably have some good ideas about diversity, though that looks different probably in many different countries. But basically uh, diversity is having a diverse group, community, organization, um, with variety of social and cultural characteristics. characteristics. Equity is making sure everyone has access and um, looking for barriers that are preventing people from having equal access and working to eliminate those barriers. And inclusion, um, this is the one that maybe gets a little bit lost. Um, inclusion isn't necessarily um, come automatically with a diverse group. You can have a diverse group, but if people don't feel empowered to contribute, um, or feel welcome or valued within the community, then it is an, an inclusive community. And I think this is important. Um, as a community of ocean mappers, I hope that we're trying to build a diverse community, but we're not just trying to build a diverse audience. We're trying to build a diverse group of people that are completely comfortable contributing and feel valued for their contribution and welcome for their, their contribution. So why are we having this discussion? I think that it, um, the words that were on the, um, the schedule were pretty good. It's been a, a kind of a crazy year. Um, US centric, I can say it's been a year of a lot of change, even the last few years, seeing things finally come to fruition that have been kind of brewing in the background for a while as far as diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I think that's happening around the world. Um, workforces are changing for the better and the ocean mapping community is not immune to these changes. Um, but I thought we could take this just a step further and look kind of more specifically at our community and use the uh, Seabed 2030, this, um, this presentation, this community, this conference um, as kind of a, a way to look at the statistics. So I just pulled out um, the registration information. This was a bit dated, it came from about a week ago. We had 
480 registrants from 75 plus countries, the most countries ever to sign up for this meeting. And I think that's great. Um, so in green, you, you see the countries as listed on people's registrations. And it's great, it's 40% of all countries, 48% of coastal countries, 62 of the 93 IHO states. Like, great, good job us, totally worth calling out um, that this is fantastic. But if we kind of dig in that to that a little bit more and look at the numbers related to each country, that registration is dominated 20% uh, by the US. And then an additional 20% from only five countries, UK, Canada, France, and Australia. I know you're all looking, keeping track to see who's winning. Um, and again, like that's great. And I do not think that registration from any country should be looked down upon, but we maybe should look at making sure that we're doing everything possible to get more registration and more contribution and more participation from other countries and from the ones that are not showing up here at all. I just want to say as a side note that I recognize the ridiculousness of using a Mercator projection <laughs> for showing equity statistics. Um, that's what Google Stats provides and I was just doing kind of these dirty maps. So as a side note, I put up here a nice kind of visual of realistic size of countries as opposed to what we see in a Mercator projection. And maybe even more appropriate for us as an ocean mapping community, a map of the easies of different countries. And specifically here, I like to point out the contribution, the, the size of the Pacific Island nations as when we look at their easies as compared to the size of, of their island. Um, and that is actually what we're looking at in the ocean mapping world, so maybe more appropriate. So why are we having this discussion? Um, it is a worldwide phenomena that's happening right now, but it is a chance for us as a community because CBA 2030 is an initiative, but it brings together this kind of diverse community of ocean mappers from all different organizations, um, industry, commercial, et cetera. And it gives us a chance to reflect on what we see as the current state of the e and I being diversity, equity, and inclusion in our community. Um, we could talk about what we're doing, what we think is going right, what we think is going wrong, and get ideas from this diverse community. And hopefully, I'd like to come away with proposals and action items that lead us, um, lead to commitments within this community um, and within CBED 2030 specifically. So that is my intro. Um, so now kind of moving on, um, I'd like to go to my panelists. Um, uh, we'll start with Kelly Brumley, which is going in alphabetical order. Kelly, you want to introduce yourself? Hi, my name is uh, Kelly Brumley. I'm a marine geologist and I've been involved with ocean mapping since 2006, first with in the Arctic Ocean with the extended continental shelf mapping cruises with the US and Canada. And I use those data for both my MS and PhD work and then went to industry with FUGRO where I was lead scientist on regional multi-beam mapping projects and then a science manager of ocean mapping. Currently, I'm an independent contractor and I'm providing clients with C4 information um, from publicly available sources. I'm also affiliate faculty and adjunct at University of Alaska Fairbanks in Houston. So I'm on several PhD and MS committees dealing with multi-beam data. And I'm a white American woman. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, moving on to Amon. So good evening, everyone from Kenya. It's now five in Kenya. So my name is Amon Kimeli. I'm from Kenya and I have a background in marine geology, specializing in marine sedimentation. I am also a JEPCO training program alumni of year 2014-2015, that's year 11. And I'm currently pursuing a PhD in marine sedimentation at the University of Bremen in Germany. Through also the JEPCO training, I, also, I was also appointed through the IOC and I'm now a member for the JEPCO subcommittee on undersea feature names, JEPCO SCAFO. Thanks, Ema. Uh, welcome. Uh, moving on to Tina. Hi, uh, I'm Tina Martin. I'm from Madagascar. I'm currently living in New York. Uh, I work as a data manager for the Atlantic and Indian Ocean Regional Center for the CB2030 project, which is based at Columbia University. 
Uh, I joined the Nippon Foundation JEBCO training program as a fisheries biologist. And my journey with the seafloor mapping community it has demonstrated that um, using the diversity and inclusiveness make fruitful co collaborations and great achievements. So I think this panel is one of the places to increase understanding and how we can do more and better with a changing workforce. So, yeah. Great, Tina, thank you for that. Um, Allison. Uh, good day, everyone. Um, my name is Allison Proctor. I work for Ocean Floor Geophysics as the AEV program manager. Um, I live in Canada and my, on the West Coast, so it's morning here. Um, we, uh, I'm an engineer by trade and I've been working in uh, robotics for almost 20 years. Um, I've been using uh, autonomous underwater vehicles uh, for more than 10 years. And I've worked in a number of different uh, areas, both in academia and as in commercial survey. Um, and so, and I have been a part of the uh, uh, Jebco NF X Prize um, uh, experience a few years ago. And so, I'm uh, proud to uh, be a member of the Jebco community. Great, Allison, thank you. Um, and Christy. Hi, everyone. I'm Christy Reiser. Um, I am a bathymetry data manager at NOAA in Boulder, Colorado. Um, I started my offshore career on board a NOAA ship, uh, the NOAA ship Rainier, and um, sailed with, with that crew for uh, several years. Um, I also used to work with Kelly Brumley at Fugro, um, and I've also worked in the private sector uh, as an independent contractor for many different companies over the years, um, usually mostly as a, a data collection or uh, multi-beam data processor and report writer. So I've kind of um, been all over the place. Um, I have a, a, a bachelor's in geography and I also have a master's in science writing, which I think uh, writing about science is just as important as collecting uh, science and information. So I'm grateful to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, indeed. Um, that's a really useful uh, skill to have. <laughs> I think we could all use it. Um, before we get started on questions, I hope you guys can humor me for a moment. I realized that one of my slides fell out of my presentation and I thought it was equally important to the slides I presented. So I'm going to just share my screen uh, for one more moment and then we'll move on with the discussion. Um, so again, sorry for interrupting the flow, um, but I think I think this is important as well. Um, I'm just going to show this one from Google Slides. Not as pretty, uh, but like I said, I, I broke um, the one in my presentation. Um, so just one more statistic that I wanted to bring up um, was the I, idea, again, of diversity and equity, um, but also gender balance. Um, we don't have statistics on that for the registration um, as a whole. Um, as a side note, like just from observation, having attended many different seabed mapping meetings in different industries, academia, et cetera, it tends to skew male, I think is my observation, but it really depends on the, the focus of the meeting. Uh, but I could look at um, gender distribution within the JEBCO leadership. And so I just looked at the JEBCO website, and this is strictly a headcount based on names that were listed on the JEBCO guidance committee and subcommittee membership. Um, I don't know, I might have picked somebody up who doesn't have a vote. I don't know. I don't know how all that works. So having all that said, um, looking at the guiding committee overall, it's 31% female and 69% male. Um, see, I had appointed as 100% male, IOC 40-60, and the XFSU 50-50. Um, subcommittees 47 to 53. And then I also have a, a map of the country distribution. So looking at the gender distribution, um, subcommittees is pretty on par with, at least overall, with what we see in the world as far as global gender distribution. Uh, but within the guiding committee, um, it comes out to be about seven to three, which is, is not what we see um, as a global gender distribution. And is this, is this a reflection of the ocean mapping community? And if so, if that really is the reason it is like that, then what, what can we do about it? Where do we need to start making changes? So that's something that we can think about. And again, looking at the map of the distribution of the participants, and again, this is based on what was listed. I know 
for example, that Roxy is from South Africa and South Africa is not showing up because she um, has the United States as her, as her listed address. Um, but it's uh, heavily swayed toward the Northern Hemisphere. Um, we're not seeing any uh, representation from Africa or from the Pacific nations that we know now from looking at that map have such huge species. So that was really my final slide. I'm sorry that I um, missed that on the first one. And so now we can get into the panel discussion and into our questions. So like I said, I have some prepared questions. Um, we're gonna keep our video on as much as possible, but if we start to have connection issues, then um, we may turn off some of the video. Um, so, and uh, this question is to the whole panel. Um, what does diversity, equity, and inclusion look like in your current, current organizations or organizations you've been involved in previously? And if you have some experience, um, how is your organization addressing diversity, equity, and inclusion? Who wants to start? <laughs> Kelly, are you talking? We don't hear you. I can start. Okay, please do. So for me in Kenya, we have in the Kenya constitution, they have put a provision that for any appointee or any elective position, you have to have at, at least two thirds gender parity. So you should love at least two thirds of a particular gender and a third of the other gender. So that is what the constitution says, but also within my institute is that we have this provision and also government, because I work for a government research institute, government normally tries to look into recruitment of both genders on an equal, equal opportunity basis. Also for some of the experiences that I've experienced during data collection is that we have both diversity and inclusions in terms of gender, age, religion, in terms of the crew within a research vessel. So I think we are on the right track in terms of having this kind of diversity, inclusion, and even equity in terms of employment opportunities, work opportunities, and even research opportunities. I'd say, yeah. can you hear me now? Am I unmuted? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, I'd say in industry, it was kind of, um, it's kind of a mixed bag. Um, certainly in the offshore world for years and years, I was the only woman on a vessel. <laughs> um, there was one of the groups that I worked at that the uh, manager on purpose made sure that his team was pretty much 50, 50, which I really appreciated. Um, in the company at large, again, mostly male, and certainly that's who was getting promoted. Um, if you look at the management, it's almost all male. Um, so like I said, mixed bag, but when, when you know, my manager um, decided that he wanted there to be, you know, 50, 50, um, at least male, female now, um, that's a whole different situation with race. Um, but at least male, female, um, they really, you know, tried to do that at least on the team where I was. And I guess the question is, why do we even care? I mean, it's, this isn't so that people feel better, right? That they're included because they feel better. I feel like the science is better, the work is better, the more different kinds of input, the more different worldviews, the different kinds of individuals that you have on your team. So it's important, not just for, you know, some feeling, it's, in, it's important for the science and important ultimately for the product that you provide your client. Um, so I think from my perspective, I. I work for a company that is um, extremely progressive as far as uh, diversity and inclusion. Um, we, we were uh, an online remote working operation uh, before it was 
uh, before it was everyone was doing it. Um, so we've, for years and years now, we've uh, had people working from home from different countries and contributing. Um, and, uh, um, and we actually actively tried to, um, to create a balance in our offshore teams and it's hard. It's actually really hard to do. And, uh, and even though, um, so obviously I'm female and, uh, and I'm trying to create a diverse uh, team offshore in my, uh, both for my operations team and my data processing team. And sometimes I'm the only female I can find uh, to go offshore on my operations team. And so I think it's, uh, it's a really big challenge um, to try and get that uh, diversity um, offshore for sure. Um, so I have two experiences. Um, one was on the side of an NGO perspective um, and now I work with CBET 2030, but the two experiences are quite similar because um, I feel that there is a willingness to embrace that difference. Um, and it is a, um, acknowledged as a source of possibilities and or options to achieve goals. And it's important because when your voice is listened and heard and taken in account, it pushes you to achieve more and thrive in whatever responsibility you take. So what I've seen also is um, discussions around diverse diversity, equality, and uh, inclusion. Actually, I think I came from a place where I'm here, I'm passionate and I wanna do things. Um, I tend to ignore the where I'm from, what can I do? So. I think talking is important, but also reflect on the fact that it's people, it's skills, it's what we need to do, which is important. And I'm really glad that I am evolving in an environment where this is very important. And um, that's what I wanted to share. Yeah. That's a great point, Tina. Um, I have a, a, a comment as well, as many um, have already mentioned. Um, working in the private sector versus working in the in the federal government in the U.S., um, I've I've seen a big difference as well, and it, and it surprised me at first. I I started my offshore career with NOAA, and um, I always kind of felt uh, a lot more inclusion and and seen a lot more diversity aboard the ships. Um, I, I was never just the only woman on a ship uh, when, when working for NOAA. And, um, and that definitely made me feel very, a lot more comfortable um, in, in learning uh, how, to, how to work offshore. And uh, moving to the private sector, I've worked for many different companies um, over the years. And as Kelly said, oftentimes I was the only woman on the ship as well. And it didn't matter what country I was in, it didn't matter where I was sailing. Um, but I also, uh, over the past, you know, almost decade that I've been a part of the ocean mapping community, have started to really see a lot more women climbing the ranks. And, I, and my colleague and I were actually just discussing this, um, looking at, uh, you know, all these attending these different panels and symposiums this week. Um, it's amazing to see how many, uh, how many women are, are not only included in this, in this um uh, community of ours, but but are also in, in roles of leadership. And it's really encouraging to see that um, starting to really come come to fruition, so. Great, uh, thanks everybody. Thanks for everybody jumping in. I really appreciate um, your willingness to, to get right into this. And I, I, I made some notes and so some things that I, I was hearing there that um, are gonna come up in, in later questions and that we can stockpile for, for discussion. And I also see questions coming in from the audience. I appreciate that. And we, we are going to address those at some point. Um, but things that I've heard that having mandates, whether they be constitutional or within a company, um, can make change happen um, when we decide to do something and mandate it, or more likely possibly to, to actually get results. Um, I'm, I'm hearing that maybe it's um, we're seeing more equity in, say, government um, and academia, if I'm hearing Amon and, and Christy correctly, um, where we still may be suffering in the offshore side of things. 
Um, and what else? Um, oh, and the importance, importance possibly of the ability to work remotely, which is another question that we'll bring up later and what, what that means for diversity and inclusion in, in, this, uh, in this community. Um, and Tina, I really like your points about being listened to and how it, how it makes you want to be, and it is about people. Yes, it is about people, but making sure that we recognize that um, sometimes people don't feel heard for whatever reason. So um, I think all fantastic points. Uh, thank you guys. Um, and uh, yes, so I'll address. So, it, 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 an interesting point to what you just said. And then I'm, I'm also reading some of the comments that are popping up um, in the chat here. I can't tell you how many times, there were several forums um, at the last company I worked at where um, we kind of had a social media that was internal. And one of them was about, you know, it was for women in the, in the company. And I can't tell you how many times I heard that we just wanna hire the best person for the job. And for some reason, that's always a white man. And then saying that, you know, it was only males that 100% that males for IHO that were appointed. Well, I think in order to get diversity, again, not because for anybody's feelings, but because that's going to be best for science and that's best for your client is to have diversity. You should shoot it back then and say, okay, well, give us a female and a person of color for this team. We're, we're just, we're not hiring who you're saying is the best. I, I, I kind of reject that, that the best is always a, a, a male. Um, can I add on a little bit to that? Um, I agree with you. And, uh, and sometimes it, it's not the easiest path forward uh, to, to diversify your team, but it always gives you a more balanced workplace and more balanced product. And that's one of the reasons we push for it so hard. And, and what we've had to do is, is put training in. So I, it's hard to find like, and it's, it's better in the data processing community. There's a lot more diversity across, um, you know, where I can find, I can find data processors from any country um, uh, and, yeah, just I can find a lot of data processors, but you know, offshore people working on operations like deck, deck work and that sort of thing, I have a hard time finding specifically women to do that work. And so, so we've, we're training them. We're training women to do that work. We start out and we're making a place for them. And it's important to do that. I think. Well, that's it. It's providing an opportunity so yeah. that people can get those skill sets, right? Absolutely. And also yeah, maybe I, I, also to add on that and also maybe following what I'm seeing also on the question, question section is that there should be also a good balance between taking care of the diversity, equity and inclusion, but also considering that people are looking for competence and the right skills for the job. For example, in Africa here, women are now taking up more of the STEM sciences but then we still have some bit of inadequacies when it comes to marine-based STEM sciences or even seabed, seabed mapping, hydrography, and that kind of uh, uh, professional line. So we also have to find that equilibrium between uh, the diversity and also the competencies that are available. Um, I think if I, if I, as the moderator, can comment, I think this is a really good discussion and we have input coming in. I think I really like Allison's point in that, yeah, uh, we are struggling. And I see this coming in from the questions and answers too. Um, is there a lack of interest for women to join the ocean mapping community? I think that fits in here too. I, I don't know that there is a lack of interest. I feel um, some points is the, the people haven't felt trained. And I think Allison, that is a fantastic point. Um, when I was trained to do things on a deck, I felt much more empowered to do it. And until then I felt really intimidated. And from Amon's point of view, um, if, if we are missing people um, who could fill those competencies then what do we need to address? And is that pushing harder at the education level and starting younger and, and things there? Because there is nothing about anyone's um, 
personal characteristics that makes them not capable for the job. It is just the, the pool of available resources. So if that pool isn't there, what I'm hearing is that we have to make it. Does that sound reasonable? Okay, and if we could just reflect on one other question from the audience, um, which we've kind of talked about a little bit, um, but we can work on that and then move on to the next question. Uh, what are the best ways you suggest for approaching senior management PIs about the importance of going that extra mile to recruit more diverse grad students, postdocs, and staff? So have you guys personally had any experience with having to, to push on this and, and have you had successes or failures? Um, I work for the best company ever, and I have had <laughs> no problems. So I'm not I'm not good uh, to comment on that. So maybe as a current uh, grad student, uh, uh, a doctoral candidate, is that for me I find it it's it's easier to contact somebody when you have the requisite background, because when you have a requisite background and you are approaching maybe a professor for for supervision or even uh, to go through a project for your MSc or even PhD, then the right background, which now comes back to what I just said uh, initially on the competencies. So, I mean, it, it would be very easy for you to have the competencies and then approaching potential supervisors for, for grad students or even uh, MSc students that it will be a bit easier to converse, converse with a uh, contactive person for, for the same. Yeah, um, I think that process has to be two ways, um, top down and bottom up. Um, I'm still, um, say it, I say it again, I'm really glad that I am growing in a community that taking really in account um, to make the people the center. So uh, La Montaherty Herb Observatory is where I work and they're making it a concerted effort to address the issue. and. It's not just a, an, a try, it is actually at the institutional level. So I think it's encouraged to think of, think of it as not just a problem from top down or just the bottom up, but it has to be worked in the both ways. Great, thank you. Is somebody else gonna pop in? Did I hear someone speaking? Nope. Okay. All right. Great. I'm loving this discussion. There's so many questions in the audience. So excuse me if I look diverted. I'm like trying to monitor everything that's happening everywhere. But I'll, I'll throw out the next question. This one is a little more focused, um, but any of the panelists should feel to weigh in. Um, but I am uh, addressing it to Amon and Tina. Um, what has the JEPCO community done to increase diversity, equity, and inclusion in this global seafloor mapping community? Um, and other panelists, uh, if you are familiar, with JEBCO, um, or if you have experience with similar programs, please feel free to weigh in. I'm going to mute myself. My headset has a low battery, so I'm going to try and deal with that, but please carry on with the conversation. So, Tina, you want to go first? Okay, yeah. Um, so my first point of entry with the JEPCO community was um, at the forum in 2016 uh, in Monaco. And then I was part of the training, which is, um, um, it's, it's gathering five, um, yes, uh, six, six students from different parts of the world every year. And we go through a very tough training that is actually challenging you at so many points um, involving the labor, the work, but also teaching you to be tolerant because of the different culture background and also um, empathize because you have to understand where your colleague is coming from to make sure that the work that you're trying to achieve is going where it, it's supposed to be. So the real work is actually after the training because once it's achieved, you need to fit in the community. You need to find your marks. And as an alumni, um, this is something that I think JEBCO has uh, empowered at some point. 
Um, we have a network of alumni and um, Map the Gaps is where we sit at some point. Um, so we are actually um, representing 42 countries. And I do believe that each of the alumni are contributing to the community. So the diversity of where they are from and the skills that they get is actually the strength of the CHEBCO. They are like the ambassador of not just the program, but the field of CIFRO mapping. And um, I can share a few examples. So as the data manager of the CIBA 2030 for Atlantic and Indian Ocean, we had a few initiatives, including uh, education awareness and data contributions. And during those initiatives, um, I do believe the strategy that we use, uh, each of the partners and the colleagues felt empowered and included. So those initiatives need to be supported and encouraged. Um, the other thing I wanted to point is um, those alumni, and I think also the other members of the community are looking for opportunities to join and to show that actually we are here, we wanna do things um, like places where map mapping is scarcely done those people, including the alumni, act as uh, connections. And I think we should take advantage of their presence in those places to bridge and map the gaps. So I think CHEBCO has done a good thing with the training, but it needs to be pursued further. Uh, or, you know, we have CIBA 2030 and that goal to map the ocean by 2030. But we also have the UN decade for the ocean science, and it's not just gonna happen by itself. We need people, and I think that's where we have to work more, including people. And yes, that's it. So for me, I can I can add to what uh, Tina said, and maybe mention that. The JEPCO, the Nippon JEPCO training program is one of the most, it promotes diversity and inclusion because every year they have six, six trainees and they normally try as much as possible to have a 50-50 gender uh, composition. Like in my class during the 2014-2015, we had three ladies and three gentlemen. And it has provided opportunities for people from all over the world. So different cultures, different religions. So I think from that basis, they are actually the best in terms of uh, promoting the diversity, but also it helps other countries even develop capacity in terms of ocean mapping or hydrography. Because from this course, they actually don't, they exempt people from the English uh, proficiency for the for in, uh, admission into a graduate school. So it provides even more opportunity for even more people and even for people from uh, different uh, academic backgrounds. And also maybe after the training program is that JEPCO normally tries to tap into this uh, alumni of tra uh, uh, trainers, tra trainees, and they end up even being into the JEPCO subcommittees. Some go to uh, government, uh, senior positions, uh, industry, and even in academia. So I think as the JEPCO training uh, keeps on growing this alumni network, it provides an, a global network in terms of uh, the friendships that have been developed during the training and also during the, the work, uh, the work during the uh, data collection, even the processing, uh, data repositories. As you can see, the CBET 2030, it, there is a statement that says they are trying to even tap into the JEPCO alumni, uh, uh, those who have trained through the JEPCO training program. So I think uh, JEPCO has done a, a very good job in this. My only point of improvement for the JEPCO training would be that because it's a postgraduate training program, it would be even much better if they provided for those people who are interested to attain an MSc 
through the training program because normally the classes are done with MSc students from uh, the university, but only that we don't do the thesis part of the of the course. So that's my contribution. You know what struck me, Amon, about what you said that I think is um, an important point is that the people that you work with, right, the people that you do things with are who you end up doing things with later. You know, yeah. you do science with your friends, right? I mean, that's what we all want. And so by broadening what that is, it's going to broaden inclusivity. And it reminded me at the oceans meeting in Hawaii last year, one of the things that was always talked about, they had a lot of people from um, Circum Pacific um, and native communities and whatnot who were complaining that these Western scientists would come into their area and they could see them offshore mapping or doing what, you know, taking samples or whatever. And they're like, what are they doing? They don't know. They're not a part of um, the science that's happening that was funded yeah. by some agency in some other country on some boat that they don't know anything about. So just you know, we're looking at, I mean, you can start programs, you can do all these things, but I think that those of us who are actively doing science that are actively collecting data, that we ourselves need to start being more inclusive in the areas where we're working. I mean, I saw this in the Arctic Ocean that um, there were meetings with elders before we went and we had several community observers with us every year and bringing that back to the community. This is then, you're, you're, you are now being a part of that community and being able to get in, talk to people, talk to kids, you know, make friendships, build relationships. So yeah, that's important what you said, I think. Great, um, can you guys hear me okay? Great, fantastic, headset dead. <laughs> so um, that was fantastic. And uh, yeah, and I think I took a lot of things from that. And one of them being that it, Jebco is fantastic. And one of the things it, it's good at, it's just another way of building a network, which is important, um, but it's a network that makes a really strong effort to really be inclusive. So it's going outside maybe the normal networking and I'm also hearing that it's it's building that diverse talent pool um, so that we do have, we can't say that there aren't possible applicants, right? Um, because we're, we're building that application pool or we're working towards it. So I think that, yeah, great points from everybody. Um, thanks for that. Um, so I, so many questions and comments. So I think my goal is gonna be for us to work through our questions till 10, 10, um, we can go over because there's time after. So um, if I don't get to audience questions, we can spend more time on that um, for maybe like 15 minutes or so after 10. Um, but that's that's kind of where we're gonna go. But anyway, moving on to the next question. Um, and this has come up, it came up um, by Allison and um, I see it, I think a, a related question in our questions. Um, and that has to do with technology changes and what impacts well, or our technology changes having on the DE and I and the ocean mapping community. And the question from the audience that, that spurred this, um, Annie asked if, um, okay, we're talking about gender, we're talking about race, oh, that's great, but what about people with um, impairments or who need accommodations of some sort? What, what are we doing with as a community to work with that, things like closed captioning, if people really physically can't go to sea, things like that. So if you guys wanna we'll kind of comment on that. And no, oh, another good one she mentioned, like English not as a first language, making sure that all these um, resources that we're working provide are available to people who don't speak English as a first language. Like it shouldn't be a barrier um, or English at all. <laughs> shouldn't be a barrier to having all of these resources available. So. Um, open to all you guys if you want to talk about that. Allison, you might want to start since you talked about remote work as part of your organization. Sure. Um, so uh, for over the last year, we've uh, really started to um, embrace uh, kind of the concept of remote um, support 
and remote processing for our offshore operations. And, uh, and it's, um, you know, the push has really been from, from the commercial side, uh, uh, mostly due to, uh, well, we've always wanted to do it, but the pandemic has made it really important because uh, suddenly there's a lot of restrictions on international travel. Um, but, uh, but there's a whole bunch of really amazing uh, benefits, side effect benefits. Um, and so like a lot of the um, things that I've, I've had in the past restrict me um, when I'm trying to hire people. Um, so visas are a huge problem when we're trying to get people onto our offshore team and uh, people that just, I can't get a visa for them. And so I can't hire them. Uh, and so that's uh, now that it, once we start introducing uh, the, the concept of processing, processing offshore data from your home um, and interacting with the vessel from your home, that's gone. So I don't need visas for those guys. So, um, so that's, uh, I think that's a huge benefit that technology is uh, is giving to us, and it also goes towards that that same question about um, uh, people that need uh, that can't go offshore for because they have um, a physical impairment or or maybe you're a stay at home mom or a stay at home dad and you have uh, you know 12 hours out of the day you have a commitment that you have to be at home, but you still want to be able to participate in the offshore world. And um, technology is making that happen. So um, me personally, uh, you know, our uh, Canada has kind of restricted international travel for the last, um, since, since last March. And our companies decided that, you know, they don't want to have people going against that Canadian uh, travel directives. And so I've been working on offshore from my home office for the last year and uh, participating in the in the offshore survey using cameras and chat servers and uh, and audio communications uh, over satellite uh, network and it it's I feel like I'm there uh, yeah. so it's been an amazing experience and uh, and I think you know it's just going to keep growing uh and we're going to be able to give opportunities to a lot more people. Yeah, it's a complete and total game changer. I mean, Noah and Nautilus, y'all are used to that telepresence. Y'all are used to having kind of a world, you know, on the boat with you. But in industry, I'm telling you, it just, COVID has forced it. There was talk, 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 but now it, <laughs> it's forced it. And I tell you, I, I kind of love that, you know, all these Zoom meetings and everything that we're all attending to do our business. I love it that the dog's barking. I love it that there's a child, you know, dad or mom holding the kid or, you know, whatever. Life has been brought into our workplace. And I think being able to bring life offshore that sometimes is so often like this reset button, you're completely removed from all of life, which a lot of us really like. But you know, the, the ability to be inclusive because of, you know, telepresence and, and I mean, it's, it's going to be a game changer. I would say all of the things that we've discussed can be fixed by more and more, uh, you know, kind of telepresence. I'd like to, uh, I'd like to bring up a point too about the, uh, the new, um, kind of way of life we have now with COVID. Um, and, and it's something that David Wyatt actually addressed uh, in yesterday's scope session. Um, and he, he made the point that uh, specifically like with this uh, symposium with Map the Gaps, um, it's been a great uh, example of of seeing more and more people participate from more places uh, across the globe. And not only that, but but being able to see more people participate with maybe a lower rank, you know, and, and not, not every employee gets to travel to Europe um, or, you know, not every employee is allowed to, to go to, you know, sessions that, that may have a, a higher cost uh, for attendance. And so having this, this ability to, to bring the community together, I think is awesome because we also get a much more diverse perspective um, when we, when we see the different panels and see the different comments coming in on, on the, um, discussion groups. So I'm really excited to see how, uh, how the telepresence world is affecting the science community. It's really fun. 
Oh, and just a note, you know, at Fugro, there was a gentleman that had 20 years offshore and then an accident actually that occurred. He is wheelchair bound. And so you have 20 years worth of experience with this guy. He can no longer go offshore, but now he can't. And I just, I love that. Thanks to, you know, thanks to telepresence and, and technology. Thanks, yeah, all like really great points. Um, and yeah, I took a lot from that. And so I think, yeah, telepresence is having a huge impact on our community ability to remote work is opening up doors and agreed with Christy um, that the fact that though, you know, there's a lot, there's negatives of these virtual formats, but it does make it accessible for so many more people who if only one person from that organization was going to get sent to this meeting it wasn't going to be them so we're really opening it up to those people to weigh in and, and see that they we want their opinion and their and they can help like they could be part of this community and they can contribute and it doesn't matter where they fall in their organization because this, this is a community that wants to bring in all those efforts um, I think that was really, really fantastic. Thank you. Um, before uh, I go on, I just want to, speaking because David Wyatt came up, I just want to read um, his comment from my pre presentation just to put this out there and make sure it's clear. Um, David just wants us to know that 100% uh, male of the IHO appointees is a result of nominations of the member states. Uh, the Secretariat can only select from nominations received. Understood. Thank you, David. Um, and the lack of appointees from Africa is much more complex and shouldn't be considered the result of any prejudice in particular. Totally noted. And so I, I do not know much about the, the background of DEPCO, unfortunately. So I was just going on, on strict headcount. So not just trying to throw some statistics out there that were available to me. So no, and thank you for clarifying that. Can I, Joe, kick it back and say, we'd like to see some females. Bring it, yeah. give us another list. Just totally saying. valid. Yes, thank you, Kevin. So kick back to you, David, <laughs> and the IHO community. All right, um, so because we're so close to the end of the session, I want to bring up a question that um, the goal of this question is to try to move us towards where we can take this, um, what we can do as a community. Um, so that whole idea of outcomes, action items, and things like that. So I'll throw the question out there goes to the whole panel. Um, and again, we are gonna go over. Um, we can go up to 30 minutes over. Um, if you drop off, just remember there is a, a cocktail session at 11, 11 my time. So in about an hour's time. Uh, so please do come back for that, but we will continue <laughs> on. For five. At AM. <laughs> coffee, cocktail, you know, whatever. Yeah, I'll probably make a coffee. Um, but Anyway, we're going we're gonna to continue on. So let me uh, throw this really, this is a big question. So everybody listen, um, throw this out to my whole panel and the audience. Um, and I, I hope that we maintain um, a record of the questions in chat because it's been fantastic and I can't even keep up with it. I can't keep up with them, yeah. There's so many. So thank you guys. Please keep it coming because even if it's not addressed, um, this will go back into CBET 2030 and the Depco community and it can be address later. So don't, if, if I'm not getting your question, please don't stop. Uh, your, your points are all valid and important. All right, here we go. Diversity, equity, and inclusion plans are becoming standard in government, academia, and nonprofits, the Kenya constitution um, industry. And in some cases, they include real on the ground commitments like devoting resources for specialized education programs that are aimed at diversifying our industry. And th those programs sometimes are starting at the primary school level. So that's, that's commitment of one type. Um, and the idea of resources, I think, is really important. Making, knowing where our resources are going and taking into account DE&I when we allocate these, res these scant resources towards initiatives. CBED 2030 is an initiative. It's not a company or an agency. But it is a community of ocean mappers that are working on this initiative. And as a community, we can choose to make real and explicit commitments to DE&I. How can we ensure that this community is inclusive, um, allows members of all genders, backgrounds, national origin, et cetera, to thrive? But So not just show up, or not just be an audience, but to actually thrive. And what, as a community, what should our diversity, equity, inclusion plan look like? Um, and can we go so far as to call it a DE&I mandate? Because um, I 
my experience with OET and Nautilus um, and their mandate to have 50% females. And from what I'm hearing in other organization, um, mandates have made the difference sometimes. So um, anyway, I throw that out to you guys. And what we're trying to do is come up with some, some outcomes and some action items for this community. I'd, I'd like to um, bring up a point that it was actually um, a comment um, by Guy Knoll. Um, he brought up the NOAA Teacher at Sea program that uh, I'm just going to read the comment real quick. It specifically targets teachers from multiple levels and areas who are encouraged to not only um, talk to the scientists but all about their careers, but also the crew members, uh, many of the teachers and thus their students had no idea of the diversity of opportunity in marine careers. I think that's absolutely spot on. And as someone who sailed on a ship and had a lot of interactions with teachers at sea from the NOAA Teacher at Sea program, some of those people are still my very close friends. And, and I love that, that there's people from all over the country that I got to make a connection with and, and they, they got to see what really happens offshore and bring that into the classroom. And that inspires people to get involved in our community and, and inspires kids to say, I want to be a scientist. I want to be on a boat. And I think that's a really exciting um, way to, and positive way to, to bring out um, more diversity and inclusion. So thank you, Guy, for, for bringing up the Teacher at Sea program. Christy, to add to that, uh, actually, Christy and I went to, and on our own time, you know, uh, every, every year I go to uh, UT, and we talk to the um, the geology and geophysics class. And uh, when Christy came with me, I had her, you know, we, we talked about the kind of career you can have. And even people that were in geophysics had no idea kind of the, the diversity of choices that they had within ocean sciences with the skill set that they were learning. So that's pretty easy. It took us an afternoon, you know, and we gave a talk and it, and it, it brought ocean sciences to, you know, 30 people. I mean, that's little, but if we're doing stuff like that all the time in universities, that's, you know, it's proselytizing, right? It was easy and it was fun. Yeah. <laughs> So I think the point we are trying to make here is educating our community is very important. Um, I like to think, and I think my team too, think of the CBET 2030 initiative as a big puzzle that we're trying to achieve, um, but not just on the side of the data, but also on the side of how much people understand about seafloor mapping, how is it important to you know, sustainable development, or even for a simple fisherman who can understand, oh yeah, I need to understand what's going on under the ocean in order to improve, let's say my, uh, my fish uh, catch or something very basic. So I think to understand and go beyond uh, cultural barrier would be something very important to consider. So I was involved in a, education awareness program last year where they ask you it's a similar to ask a scientist type of thing where I have to describe along the week the steps that I had during my career and try to inspire people so I think this is something we should do but breaking the language barrier because not everyone speaks English, not everyone speaks Spanish or any language. So we have to take advantage of that uniqueness um, and work toward that to make sure they understand what CIPA 2030 is doing or what JEBCO community is doing. So I think it's somewhere. You know, CIPA 2030 is supposed to be a crowdsourced bathymetry program. And I feel like if the focus was more on that crowdsourcing, more on social media, more on getting it out there, that it's open to everybody that just naturally the community will be more diverse. You know, so I think that there's some work to do with um, our social media presence and that messaging. And that to me feels like where uh, money and energy should be spent. If we're, you know, wanting to get the fisherman and his fish finder data and get them involved and you know all of that so that would be helpful
Um, I also think actually uh, kind of eliminating language barriers is, is really important. Um, and, uh, and also um, providing different entry levels uh, or different levels of entry for education. So, uh, that, sorry, that came up backwards. <laughs> Provide um, places where people can participate with different education levels because we can't educate the whole world. We want to, but uh, it's just, it's not, rea it's not possible. But if we can have places where people can participate um, with different education levels, then they find a way in and then they can uh, find a way up. Um, and, uh, and, you know, as, and I think the, so, and maybe the first step of that is just breaking down that language barrier. And I know I, I work with a fairly diverse group of people with different, uh, different first languages, most of them, that, but they all speak English to some extent. And we, we often rely a lot on uh, Google Translate and other kind of archaic ways of uh, making sure that we're in, we understand each other. And, and the, the biggest tool is really patience, right? So I, I have to be patient with them and they have to be patient with me. Um, but uh, I feel like we could do a better job at that. Like there's gotta be, like this is a pretty, we got a lot of tools out there uh, that we could be using to um, to make sure that uh, you know our our messages can be understood across multiple languages and in multiple cultures. Well, that's the joy of um, having your message on social media, right? You can easily Google Translate that. Yeah, I mean that's pretty easy. Iman, did you have any any thoughts on that? Yeah. So maybe uh, to add just on the language barrier and also the diversity in terms of the data is we should strive to promote the open science so that we can open the data to even a more diverse user group. Because then when you have data, which is and not just raw data, we share data that can be used by even laymen or laywomen, or people who don't have a background in let's say geophysics or even marine sediments or, or, or something like that. So we just share data, promote open data sharing in usable formats that a larger diverse and inclusive group of people can, can uh, gain benefit from. And this will be even uh, much better in terms of reaching out to people. And even those who will be now interested can even assist in the crowd sharing of whatever they have. Amen. That's like, that's bottom line. The way that we do science, I think, um, sometimes is keeping us from um, moving forward with just who's collecting, you know, there's a lot of talk about data collection, but rarely talk about end users. Uh, you know, where these data go. I mean, you can have all the, you can have the completely the seafloor mapped, but what good does that do to the public or to policymakers if it's not interpreted and not out there? And the only way you're going to be able to find out is paying $35 to get a, um, a journal article. You know, just the way that we do science, I think it needs to uh, fundamentally change. And um, that's, a very broad subject, I realize, but if those of us that are involved are always kind of preaching that these data need to be public and not just the raw data, but the products that you produce as well, instead of being fearful that someone's going to, you know, jump our ideas, you know, oh, we, we need to be ready, release some of that fear and, and, and put it out there because that's how you're going to be inclusive is if it's available to all. And nobody has money on their grant enough to take and reprocess and regrid a bunch of data. We need more than just raw data. 
Oh, great. Thank you guys. Um, so many, so many good points I was trying to write down um, while you were talking, um, but some that I latched onto just because they were also kind of floating from my head, um, the, the language barrier thing. And uh, just to kind of give a shout out where I think uh, CBED 2030 has been doing, and um, I, or, I'm sorry, Jebco has been doing a good job um, I noticed in the scrub session, um, the coordination with the regional IHOs. And I think that is a fantastic way to both use your network and get beyond the Google Translates when possible to get better products. So there you have, I just briefly looked at it, but it looks like a webinar series aimed at different, um, different parts of um, regional IHOs, sorry. Um, and I can't remember the acronym off the top of my head. I'm sure Vicky will yell at me and type in, but um, it was, I thought it was great. I think that's another great use of technology and a, a positive thing to make sure that the reach, that there is inclusivity and equity by making it accessible, um, involving these IHOs. And I, I saw Aileen popped in to say um, about the availability, a possible action island item there. And I think we've talked about this in past meetings um, the availability of like a slide deck. So anyone in this community um, has some tools in hand to present to their sub community um, when the opportunity arises and to present in their native language and to present to people that they have better um, engagement with. So I think that, um, I think that's a good idea too. And I think um, at least in the scrum meeting, I saw a really positive move there. All right, that was fantastic. Um, you guys were great. <laughs> There's so many questions and, and comments that I don't even really know where to start. So I'm gonna like quickly scroll through and just try and pick a question. And if my panel members can do the same, if you see anything that draws your eye, um, please bring it up. So let me see if I can find one to get us started. Oh, so hard to keep up with. No, I'm trying to scroll. There's so, so, so many questions. Can we just open up microphone? <laughs> so many questions and comments. Is it? Uh, well, let me just like, let me throw this one out. Um, it has to do with education. Um, in the past, Jebco Nippon Foundation Ocean Mapping Program was looking for offshore apprenticeships. So this has to do with giving people opportunity. Um, and do we as a group and with our um, industry connections, do we foresee opening up private sector opportunities for more inclusiveness and changing the ratios? I'm going to again do a shout out to Nautilus. We've had uh, many Jebco scholars out on the Nautilus and we um, are in normal times, <laughs> it changes with the year, but we often have more flexibility um, to bring people out from different countries. Um, so I, that's my shout out, but please you guys Feel free to pop in on that and um, let's look through and see if there's anything else that we want to try and address. Allison, you talked about um, the ability to remote work. Does that also up and uh, open up things like internship opportunities, if only at the remote level? Um, yeah, it definitely does. Uh, so uh, I think that, um, you know, we're, we're just getting into it now and kind of discovering all of the opportunities that it's going to provide to us. Um, but for sure, um, uh, you know, I think at the, one of the other barriers about offshore is that you have to have a significant amount of training to actually just go step on the boat, <laughs> right? So like weeks worth of offshore safety training, it costs money and it's not something that you can just, you just don't go train somebody who you don't think you're gonna be able to uh, keep for a while. Um, so I think uh, telepresence really gives you the opportunity to take someone who just wants to try it out and uh, kind of see what it's about um, and, and where their skills might, might fall in and uh, so like that that's perfect for internship kind of opportunities um, and then uh, you know when when somebody really starts sparking an interest then it can turn into uh, actual offshore work 
Yeah, industry has a lot of regulation, so we can't just bring people offshore. You have to have certification, you have to take safety classes, you have to do the upside down in a helicopter thing, you know. So it's and that that costs the company quite a bit of money to be able to do that. So, but yeah, with technology, there's no reason why you can't have a student or two just coming in, sitting and watching. And learning how to process data, watching it happen, you know, and that, and, and that will just take um, people willing to do that and going that little extra mile to make that happen. But I think it's the future. You know, on that note about, uh, you know, we're talking about education and, and bringing people into our community, uh, especially focused with education and and education is sometimes not available to a lot of large, you know, groups of people in different places in the world. And um, I, I, everything I learned about hydrography was in person on a boat. I never went to school for it. You know, I, I studied geography, which was definitely helpful, you know, but, um, but the actual data processing and, and every procedure, that, you know, collecting CTD data, whatever, whatever it was, you know, I, I learned it from, from mentors on my ship. And I think it's a great way to learn. And um, so promoting, you know, even even in a telework presence, I think that there are ways. I actually have uh, several um, two two students that I work with in my in my job now, and they have had one day of of in person training, um, and then we all had to go telework uh, because of COVID. And it is exceptional to see how well they have worked, even with Zoom meetings and you know working together. Um, and and answering questions over uh, you know tag ups and and so I think there is a way forward um, with an education process that's that's less formal than a than a university level and and gives provides more opportunity for inclusion. Great guys, thank you. Um, there was one. Uh, if anybody else has anything, please. Um, Stop me. <laughs> I just did see one other thing that kind of spoke to me having come past from industry. I think it was uh, John Wall, I could be wrong. It was in the, the panelist comments. Um, and there are also comments coming from the IHO community about how their program works. And I under please understand, obviously, the panelists, we don't have a lot of insight into those politics. So we're not trying to insult or offend anybody. But thank you for, for putting in that information to help us out. But John pointed out that. Um, there uh, was somebody coming into that leadership committee from industry, and that was a first. And is that a different kind of diversity? And I think that is a valid point. Um, having come from industry, um, just the kind of disdain we got in sometimes academic circles or government circles uh, was very frustrating sometimes because we have valid points and we have valid ideas and industry is not always your enemy. <laughs> so that's my input. Do you guys have anything to say on that? That's true. I think there is sometimes a bias against industry and within industry, a bias against academia and maybe broadening um, uh, the use of students for projects, they're cheap, you know, and, and people, and you can teach, I mean, all, you know, all of that knowledge of people in industry, it'd be great if it was also teaching. So just kind of thinking about things differently from industry, I think is is also good. You know, just internalizing from our in industry perspective, that maybe we should look out. You know, we're always on these deadlines, and so it's always really fast, and so you don't have time to like be thinking about new ways of doing things. But that's on us to do, and I think that it would be good to do if we want our company to have more uh, people of color and more uh, females. Then we're going to have to physically commit to them. And involving students is one way. Um, <clears throat> I spent uh, the first part of my career in academia and then I moved to industry afterwards. So I've seen kind of both sides of the fence and, um, and we each do, uh, 
each group does their own thing well and and lacks in the other side <laughs> right so you know in academia you're always chasing the grant and you don't have that like continuity and in 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 uh, um, in industry you're chasing the money and you don't have that uh, kind of training and uh, community outreach that you do in and but the two work together really like you need the two of them to work together and so it, it would be it would be really good to kind of knock that wall down and be able to for everyone to be able to um, uh, capitalize on the other's uh, strengths. Great guys, thanks for weighing in on that. Um, does anyone from the panel have anything that they, they saw come in that they want to address before we, we sum up? Going once, Tina. Yes, um, there's a question here asking, was DEI part of the motivation for creating the JEPCO alumni program back in 2003? Um, I joined the program in 2016, so I hope my answer won't be taken as uh, or misinterpreted. But I think the whole mandate for the JEPCO community is to work hand, to ha hand in hand to probably at the beginning to discover what's underneath the sea and use that knowledge for advancing um, economy or science. And then furthermore, um, it's not just limited to a group of, you know, because back in history, probably knowledge was limited to a group of educated people. But I do believe that the aim of CHEPCO is not limited as such. So I think creating the program was more into empowering and gathering more people to go through that journey of discovering the ocean and also reaching out at those who actually has some challenges to have the skills on, on their side. So I think we cannot say just that DEI was the motivation to create the program. I think it was based on a need to achieve things. And I think the diversity part of it is just, you know, a tiny dot that was there. So we took it and used it to make achievements. So I hope my answer was not going beyond or misunderstood. Un misinterpreted, but this is how I understand how and why there is a JEPCO community. But I see Aya is going to add more on that. You know, people are taught, there's lots of questions and, and comments in this group about uh, the about language diversity, right? Just by not everything. And how do you solve that? We don't have a Star Trek translator. So how how do we solve that? Crickets. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> it's, I know. <laughs> it's hard. I, know. I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> yeah, like Google Translate, that's the tool I have. And I feel yeah. like there should be like with the collective intelligence on this planet, we should have figured out a better way by now. And all of us ocean sciences, uh, scientists are like, yeah, how do you, you know, I wish that there was somebody that knew how to do that that was listening because <laughs> yeah how helpful would that be to have you know chiron scrolling um in whatever language you want that'd be amazing i was always jealous of the un headsets right i know right just, you just have a translator in your ears like yeah. how amazing would that be in real life i i would take that microchip i think me too definitely <laughs> All right, guys, um, we only have a few minutes before we really should close up. So I, I think I want to give all of my panelists an opportunity to like end on a statement, um, something that whatever, what something that you feel is important that you want to make sure is clear. Um, and then we'll, we'll close out the session. Um, we have the questions in the chat and I'll talk to Aya and Tim about how to go forward with this because there's a lot to address and I think it's amazing. 
Um, and if, um, please, everyone come back for the cocktail <laughs> or coffee hour in about um, 35 minutes. So I, as the moderator, I'm gonna take my opportunity to just say my, my little statement. Um, this panel and preparing for this panel totally opened my eyes to things that I wasn't thinking about. I do tend to focus on gender because that's my experience, um, but inclusivity, equality, and looking at things from different countries' perspective is something that I don't think about enough. And it was really amazing to have that opportunity to do that in preparation for this. But coming back to my, horse or whatever um, of gender, women make up 50% of the country. And until we see 50% of women um, in positions, um, it's, it's, not, it's not equal. And if, if we don't have that opportunity, if that pool doesn't exist, then we need to make it exist. <laughs> so 50% is, is equal. Anything less is not too many women. So that's my point. All right, so let's go in order. So I'll go to Allison, and if you have nothing to say, just say no, thank you. Uh, I do feel put on the spot to come up with something to say, but uh, um, <laughs> you wrap I it think, all up for us, Allison. <laughs> um, so I think that it, it it really is super important to have a diverse uh, workforce. It 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 makes ideas. Uh, brings in new ways of doing things, new ways of thinking about things. Uh, it balances out uh, the, the culture on board the ship in the office. Um, and so it's something we should all strive for. And it, it is not, it's not easy. It's hard. And we, we're just going to have to work at it. That's the bottom line. Yeah. Each of us and not just, you know, putting in place, uh, diversity programs but you know each of us even on the project level can on purpose include other people and maybe go outside our comfort zone a little bit and you know include someone that isn't just like us and communicate with those communities where we're surveying definitely and build those friendships. Um, so I think my take from this meeting, um, and thank you for the opportunity, because um, I'm not used to talk about diversity at all. As I said, I'm more focused on what can I do regardless of gender or um, power. So uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, my take would be on um, in inclusiveness. Um, so we talked about diversity of the people, but I want to take uh, it to the level of the data because this is where we are heading. Um, we see the 2030. So I've, I, um, I wish that whoever was attending today could spread the word that inclusiveness is not just about people and diversity is not just about what we've seen today, but includes the information. Um, so that means we need to make an effort to acknowledge that the difference in how we handle data, how we acquire data and how we use them, and especially on the, on the policies. So each institution, government, has different approach but I think if we look at the important things when we create MOUs or when we work on how we can exchange data or even more on having open access to those data we have to respect each other's um, way of doing things and find hopefully a consensus and I hope that we could go reach to that point and then make not just the 2030 but the whole mapping community grow better in that way. So that's it. Anyone? So I want to thank the organizers for the opportunity. I've also learned, uh, notwithstanding that I was a panelist, I've also learned a few things. And I was just say that let us all strive to attain diversity in terms of knowledge, data collection, and even the products that we are going to give to the public. So 
as we normally say, we have only around 20% of the world oceans flow mapped. We should strive by 2030 as CBET 2030 projects uh, entails to see that we can map all the oceans by that time, but also have that acceptability from everyone. As you can see from the questions we are normally, when you talk of diversity, people normally think only of gender and, and race. But then we have seen we are talking of inclusion also for and diversity for people with disability. You are talking of the LGBTQ community. You are talking of people who are not even from your area of expertise. So we should all strive to that space. Thank you. Okay. And Christy. Yeah. Uh, also, thank you so much for having me on the panel. It's been very eye-opening. Um, one of my favorite things about this community is that it is a very, very tight-knit community. It doesn't take a lot of effort to stumble across somebody you used to work with offshore or somebody you knew from a, a you know conference or whatever. So I, I love that we are very well connected in this community, and and I love meeting new people. Um, I do want to bring up one point, and I and I have seen several uh, posts about it in the in the comments. Um, uh, th thinking about not just, um, you know, inclusivity of, of um, you know, people of color and men and women, but also gender inclusivity and also the LGBTQ community, um, I think, is, is often underrepresented, especially in the offshore world. Um, and so I want to I want to wave the, the pride flag a little bit here and, and and say, hey, everybody think about that as well, because I think it is really important to to consider, um, you know, as many groups as you possibly can, um, and and I think this panel has been great, uh, and it's been great to hear everybody's opinions and and how you know how they um, make things work in their own in their own organizations. So um, thank you very much. I really hope that uh, you know we can Im implement more programs and and more education tools in the future to to broaden this topic. And Kelly, you talked, but I wasn't sure. Was that your statement or not? <laughs> Do you have? Did you have anything else you want to say? Just don't get me going. <laughs> huh? Don't get you going. Okay. <laughs> and, and Free the data. That's that's my last thing. Free the data. Make your make your data and your products available to end users across the globe because that's how science is best going to happen. Is if it's not just raw data, but that you know there's something that. A geologist can grab easily and go interpret for policymakers for the people. Well, we're making the grid, right? We're making that public grid. Um, and yeah, just a final shout out on gender. Absolutely, a lot of comments that gender is not just female and male, and that is a whole other amazing world that we're getting into, and I love it. Um, and so we'll have to learn ways to, to make sure that everyone's included. Um, thank you, guys. This was really fun. It was great. Um, so we'll close out the meeting. I hope to see people at the cocktail coffee hour. And um, again, all the, the questions and um, comments are saved. So the community will think about where to go forward with that um, and if things need addressing. And Aya does do the survey. Yeah. All right. Aya, did you have anything else to finish up or, or Tim? Sorry. Yeah, well, Again, thank you for everyone. Thank you everyone for coming and joining. This is a very wonderful um, discussion. And I hope that this doesn't, this is, this is a mind opening um, session and this shouldn't be um, taken by people as offensive or anything like that. This is for us to know and be aware that everyone is welcome in the community, in ocean mapping community. And, and I think whatever you're doing or whatever, um, um, profession you are you have so well um, we hope to see you in the cocktail um, I don't know how we're going to do that but we're going to try <laughs> and enjoy um, last thing please um, if you haven't um, done the survey um, requested by the CBED 2030 project that's one way of having yourself included right so there is no way that the world would know what you need and what you think if you don't say it. So that's one thing. I mean, people are trying to reach out to you, but you should also try to make efforts to reach out to those people even to, and to those groups. 
So it's a two-way and communication is the best way to be able to achieve whatever we want to achieve. Now that we're trying to do something that is globally um, important. Well, Tim, you have anything to say? Oh, I think, um, yep, nothing. Okay, well, again, again thank you very much. Um, we have all the chats and the q and A's saved. So if anyone in the, in, the, in, the, in the panel would want to expand this and reach out to you guys, then they will do it. And we hope to see you again in the next sessions and until tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Sorry, I was Bye. on mute. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. <laughs>